Hey guys, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Baby, you sound sick. Oh gosh. I Are think, you sickly? I think it's just sinus stuff. Yeah, you woke up and you've got a little bit of something happening. Yeah, I know. I'm going to blame it on the weather. I'm going to blame it on the rain. North Carolina's weather pattern is <laughs> off the chain. I don't know what's going on. Mother Nature, you're drunk. Go home. It'll be 65, 70 degrees one day. The next day it's snowing. Then we'll have like four days of monsoon weather where it's just nothing but rain and flooding. And then it'll be back to like a nice spring day and then more snow. I don't know what's happening. What the hell? You know, the, the other day my phone said it will be 35 degrees colder tomorrow. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> what the hell's going on? Yeah, so I think the weather probably has you maybe a little messed up. Yeah, I know. I told you I was going to sound a little stupid. No, you sound fine. Okay. Our listeners are very forgiving. Oh, and I love them. They understand. You're real people. You get sick here and there. I'm not I'm not some big personality that never gets sick. So, Mount Murders, we like to have the show, well, I, I like to say it's a mullet. We have business in the front, party in the back. Yeah, that's right. So, let's take care of some business right now. Okay. Special offer via Patreon. If you sign up at $5 or higher this month in February... We'll send you a specialized custom video message from us. Oh, wow. Yeah. I might sign up. You'll also access more content. I mean, we're working right now to improve quality, quantity on Patreon, and funds we earn on Patreon directly support the show and help us grow Mountain Murders Podcast. You can sign up for as low as $1 a month, or if you want to, you can make a one-time donation via PayPal. Wow. So if you're like, hey, I love your podcast, here's 10 bucks. We'll put that uh, toward a, a really good common goal of, of making Mountain Murders better. Keep it going. Also, we have passed, I mean, just blown by 50,000 downloads. Yeah, I'm just uh, that blows me away. We're almost at like 55,000. Yeah, I know. Which is a huge milestone for us. I think so, considering we thought five people might listen when we first started. Well, we're independent. We don't have a big podcast company backing us marketing the show I mean this is all like a grassroots literally do it yourself kind of podcast yeah. so the fact that we even have 55,000 downloads is incredible yeah I think it amazes me every day talk about a self-esteem booster yeah I, know. I feel so validated in what I do how about yeah, I you <laughs> when people say oh I love your podcast you're my go-to listen to you every day going to work things like that it just every single time I read something like that blows me away. Yeah, it makes me feel really good. Also, I think we should have maybe a Patreon episode or maybe we'll make it a, a regular show where we read some of our bad reviews. <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of them, but they're pretty funny. Yeah, we got some good ones, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, taking the time to give us a shitty review. We get a lot of entertainment. We get a lot of mileage out of those. True. Another live show is coming up in May. Which is really not that far away, Dylan. Oh my Just gosh. Just a couple of months at Fleetwoods in Asheville. They've invited us to come back. They really had a great time, our first show. So they want us to come back in May, do another show. Also, they're expanding the venue a bit. They're going to have more seating, which means more tickets. Yeah, and more chances to see and meet Mount Murder's family. If you want to buy tickets, they're on sale through brownpapertickets.com. And, of course, you can find our event on Facebook if you go to the Mountain Murders page. One of my goals for 2020 is to offer, like, a mini tour. And, again, we were talking about um, growing the podcast and how those donations on Patreon really help support us. And this is one way you can do that because I want to offer, like, a bit of a mini tour. So I'm going to be working to book a few more live shows this year. And if you want mountain murders in your town, drop us a line and let us know. Oh, I'd love to travel around and meet some people. Let's give some shout outs to our new patrons. Thank you, Jennifer, Holly, Patty, Deidre, Sherry, and Cody. Yeah, great, right? Thanks, guys. Sherry lives right here in our hometown. Wow. Yeah, and Cody is up in Avery County, North Carolina. Oh, I love it up there. And they, from what I understand, have had a lot of snow. Oh, yeah, they, yeah they're they a little Well, we've north. had basically like a dusting or an inch. I've had people in Avery County reach out and say, girl, we've had like 19 inches up here. <laughs> yeah, they're on the line where we get the crappy monsoons and they get actual snow. Yeah, it is a beautiful area. We should go up there someday. I love it. A little road trip. It's so pretty there up in the 
the northern part of the mountain. We still have a few of those Mountain Murders t-shirts left, mostly larges and extra larges. We had a great listener, Stephanie. She's all the way up in Massachusetts who bought one via Instagram. I can't wait to see her selfie in a Mountain Murders t-shirt. Oh, wow. Repping the Mountain Murders all the way up north in Massachusetts. Are you ready for today's case, Dylan? I am. It sounds very interesting. Speaking of all the way up north in Massachusetts, we're, we're going to be talking about the New England area today. And of course, Mountain Murders podcast. We're an Appalachian true crime podcast. But hey, Appalachia is not limited to our area here in western North Carolina. It spans thousand miles more, you know. I mean, there's a lot of area. Yeah, it goes all the way up the East Coast. It sure does. So today's story is actually going to take place in New England, in the Appalachian area up there. We've been wanting to travel up there. <laughs> we have been. <laughs> Are you ready to get started? Yeah, let's do it. This is a great old case. As you say, we're going to get in our... Oh, our uh, limited edition Mountain Murders way back machine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It's sort of like Scooby-Doo's Mystery Machine. Yeah. Only I like to imagine the Wayback Machine is like a really cool, like, 67 Cadillac, like, Fleetwood hearse. Yeah. That's wrapped in, like, a Mountain Murders design and has some of those, like, fuzzy balls, like, uh, you know, hanging from the interior, leopard print seats, that kind of thing. Oh, we need one of those. Some fuzzy dice. And then we could get like a serial killer. Some naked lady mud flaps. Serial killer bobbleheads all the way across the dash. are you? Are you having a great visual of what it's like to be in the way, way back machine? Yes. Okay, it's pretty funky. So everybody strap your seatbelts. Let's go back in time. Or if you're in the back, just lay down flat. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Margaret McNally was born in Ireland in 1864 in the county Antrim. Reports speculate she was somewhere between three and eight years old when she immigrated to the United States with her parents. The Irish family settled in the Big Apple, New York City, as many immigrants did at that time. New York City was a huge melting pot. Still is. Yeah, but that was the ground zero for all immigration into the country for the most part. Right? Ellis Island? Right. Yeah, Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island. I mean, millions of people passed through the halls of Ellis Island. Well, maybe some of your ancestors did. I'm sure. Between 1820 and 1860, the Irish were over one-third of all the immigrants to the United States. Estimated 4.5 million Irish entered the U.S. between 1820 and 1930. That's a lot of Irish. It is. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a history lesson here. The Irish potato famine blight had begun to recede by about 1850, but the country was still ravaged with poverty, disease, starvation. In New York City, the McNallys, like other immigrant families, faced difficult conditions, such as unsanitary living spaces, just in general, communities weren't very clean, they didn't have plumbing, water, trash pickup. Well, yeah, you're already getting all these people crammed in a very small area with uh, no, no infrastructure like they have nowadays. So everything's wood. None of those public services, the public muddy, works. Yeah, the muddy streets. Exactly. The Horses. Refuge. Just shitting all along the streets. Oh, my God. I so, just imagine, you know the Seinfeld episode where Kramer gets the horse and carriage and he's feeding the horse beefarino? Yeah. And then the horse is just like farting on the people in the carriage? <coughs> that's what I imagine. <coughs> oh, sorry. Poor thing. I'm sorry. So that's what I imagine is happening in these New York streets. So in uh, this, still people have chamber pots. Yes. So people are throwing it, they're throwing it out the fucking door and window. Yeah, throwing their trash out the window. Oh my god! Even then, why did that seem like a good idea? Wouldn't you have like a spot to empty your pot? You'd think. Oh. Disease was spreading, as you can imagine. Oh, things like cholera and dysteria. Is that one of them? Flus, viruses, just all kinds of nasty stuff. Ugh. Social problems like violence, alcoholism, and of course, discrimination were huge. The Irish immigration was the 19th century refugee crisis. They threatened to take jobs away from Americans and were seen as a strain on welfare budgets. They were accused of being criminals and rapists. Sounds a lot like the political rhetoric we hear today. Yeah, it's funny how they keep rolling out the same game plan on things like this. Yeah, just targeting different groups of people. Yeah. 
The Irish were viewed not only as poor, but unskilled refugees, and even worse, they were Catholic. Protestants and Catholics were already at each other's throats before that potato famine had wilted the crop in Ireland. In cities like Philadelphia, anti-Catholic and anti-Irish mobs burned churches, destroyed houses, many of those like tenement-style houses where these immigrants were living. You can read up on the deadly Bible riots of 1844 to get an idea of the political and religious climate that was happening at that time. Though the number of German immigrants matched the same, you know, the Irish basically, the Protestants had created a propaganda campaign against the Irish Catholics. People of the older generation could remember a time when America was still an English colony and that papal effigies were like burned in the streets during Guy Fawkes types of celebrations. Remember the 5th of November? Oh, what happened on the 5th of November? <laughs> Do I have to give you more history lessons? Oh, wait, or is this be for Vendetta? <laughs> no, we're talking oh. about Guy Fawkes. Well, yeah, he was in that. Yeah. His image. Uh-huh. Yeah, let's just get back to it. <laughs> okay. So enough of our mini history lesson. I just wanted our audience to see the political climate of the time and that living in New York City was not sheltered at all from this treatment. No, so you had all if these... anything, it puts you right in the middle of yeah. the shitstorm. Yeah, and you have all these different tensions. All these, uh, I mean, it's like you said, it's the same game plan. It's being done today in various countries around the world. But uh, you have all this uh, propaganda, all this uh, inflammatory rhetoric, and that just really creates a um, dangerous situation. From 1834 to 1844, so in 10 years, there were 200 major gang wars that broke out in New York City alone. Wow. Yes. You've seen the film Gangs of New York, you know, the Martin Scorsese film. It's a fairly good depiction of what life was like in New York City during this time period. Oh, man, I love that movie. I was reading an article where there was a history professor from George Washington University who said that it could not have been any more realistic, that it just was really spot on in capturing that time. Yeah, when these guys met up and, and had a fight, it wasn't throwing some hands and then drinking a little bit of liquor after they had weapons and I mean this seems pretty damn rough. Like an all out war. Melee weapons and all this crazy shit. Well that movie takes place in 1863 which is only a few years before Lizzie's family came to America. Wow. Life for the McNallys was not easy. I mean it was pretty rough for most Irish immigrants. Perhaps the environment in which Lizzie had grown up shaped the person she would become. I mean what is it nature versus nurture? Lizzie was described as a criminal prodigy. Now, she had violent tendencies, earning a reputation in the streets for being particularly brutal. At home, conflicts often ended in violence. She would often get into fist fights with her mother, her sister, father. Eventually, Lizzie had to leave home after a particularly bad physical altercation with her family. But when her father died, Lizzie's grief was overwhelming. She dramatically threw her body on top of his grave and was clawing at the dirt. Oh. She's one of those people who seems to have extreme emotions. Right. It's extreme anger, extreme lashing out, but she's also extremely passionate. Well, and uh, a personality like that could really get you in some trouble. Yeah, and we've seen that time and time again. Lizzie was described as being naturally ugly. Oh. Yeah. She had pale Irish skin, a short, stocky build with muscular arms. So basically, Lizzie and I have the same body type. <laughs> what can I say? Us Irish gals were built for plowing fields. Yes. Short, stocky, sturdy. Made for homesteading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. That's my family, right? Yeah. We got some homesteading bodies. And so Lizzie fell into that category but was considered just not a very attractive female. She never really had a job. The few she did have did not end well, as she was said to have thrown a knife at a fellow co-worker. She was in and out of courtrooms filing claims against former employers. Damn. Just always kind of in the middle of some drama. Sounds like a joy to be around, though. <laughs> <laughs> She's fun at parties. Yeah, and she'll stab you in the neck. Yes. <laughs> Lizzie married a man named Charles Hopkins, known as Ketz 
Ethel Brown in 1877 when she was around 13 years old. 